Hey, how you doing? Justin here. Welcome back to the Major Scale Maestro course. In this lesson, we're going to be checking out framework development. The idea of the framework here is to build a system where you can navigate your way around the fretboard easily. Always know where you are, what pattern you would be in and where the notes are, where the chords are, where the arpeggios are, everything is all based around the framework that you build on the fretboard. Now, I learned it with the minor pentatonic scale. I think the major scale is arguably better, but the cool thing is that we're going to strip it down now to octaves. So I'm going to use the major scale because it's part of the major scale course, but it's really the refinement of knowing where the octave shapes are and understanding the implications of that, where they fit within the cage system shapes as well. It's, it's quite a big deal. Now, there are lots of different approaches here. And what I really feel is that different people connect with different systems or different ideas or different perspectives. So I'm going to try and show you a whole bunch of different little ideas all kind of rolled in together, hoping that one of those is going to be the one that turns the light bulb on for you. So here's a G bar chord. Quite clearly, it is an E shape. There's pattern one, which fits perfectly around the chord shape. You can see. Quite clearly, there's a relationship there. Now, the really key things here, the root note is down here. That's the one that we've started and finished on most of the time. We'll talk about a switch up on that shortly. We've got that note. We've got here an octave. So that's also a G. And there's the other G. So we've got... There's the first octave shape. And the second octave shape would be there. You should by this point be very familiar with the idea of changing keys by moving the pattern up and down the fretboard. So uh, we had G there, if we move it up to the 8th fret, we're in C, if we move it to the 2nd fret, we're on F sharp. What's really cool though is actually the shapes work vertically as well. But there's a fly in the ointment and it's called the B string. Whenever a pattern hits the B string, it moves up one fret. Otherwise, the patterns stay the same. It's really interesting. This is one of those things that's a little bit, I think, understanding how the framework works, how the notes work, why the B string makes so much confusion on the shapes. I think it's a really fascinating thing. So let's just explore that a little bit, looking at the first octave from pattern one. So here's the very first octave shape that we've got from pattern one. Hopefully very familiar to you by now. If we're just thinking in terms of that one octave, we can move that shape around really effectively. So that was a G. If we find another G, you're up on the fifth string. Exactly the same pattern. So that one can move around. We can move it down to here, C. You can see G major and C major. Within that octave, exactly the same shape. It's G again. There's another G on the fourth string. Look, if we do it now, yeah, it's starting to sound a bit weird because we crossed onto the B string. If things go on the B string, they have to move up one fret. So it starts the same. Where it moves onto the B string, we move it up by one fret. To essentially the same thing. Two, four, one, two, four. One, three, four is up a string. If we start here on another G on the third fret, this is a three string pattern, so this is the last one that we can do. Again, two, four, one, oh, but we've gone onto the B string, so we've got to move up. Two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. Now, probably you would finger it like that. In order to keep the consistency of the pattern for now, two, four, one, two, four, one, three, four. So you can see that same one octave shape actually works all over the guitar fretboard so long as you start with your second finger on a root note. As we develop through all five patterns, these kind of things will start to become a little bit more obvious. But at this point, now that you know three patterns, I want you to start being aware of the similarity between the shapes and understanding that things just change when they move onto the B string. Okay, when a shape moves onto the B string, it moves up a fret. Okay, and all of the subsequent notes 
beyond that uh, are now shifted up that fret as well. So let's talk a little bit more about the root notes again, make sure that we're pretty clear on that. So in pattern one, based around the E shape, we've got a root note, a thicker string, fourth string, and first string. For pattern two, we're moving using that little uh, fourth string note as a pivot into this which is based around a D shape so octave uh, on the uh, root note on the fourth string and the second string now that second string one is the link to get us up into the C shape we've got now the root notes on the fifth string and the second string So now I've got a very cool, somewhat nasty little exercise for you. Whenever you're practicing any of your scale patterns from now on, I want you to start on the highest root note every second day. So alternating between starting on the lowest root note and starting on the highest root note. For many people, this is quite an exposing thing. It feels very weird. It really shows, again, that muscle memory of how much you've trained the muscles up to be playing scales a particular way. And as soon as you change where you start the starting note, feels very different but it's very very powerful so I'd really really like you to have a go at doing that so basically when you come to play your G major scale pattern one you would start here on the thinner string play all the way down all the way up as far as you can and start on that thinnest uh, finish on that thinnest root note again You would also do it for pattern two. Now, most people are already going to go Alt G on pattern two, and they'll probably start here and work it out. That's okay. When you start, that's okay. But I want you to be able to jump to that one sooner or later. That's a, that's a root note. You need to know the notes on the guitar neck. If you don't, then you've got to work on it. So we're playing in the G major. We found a G on the second string. We put our little finger on it. We work down the scale, back up as we can go and finishing on that root note again same with our brand new pattern three i know you only just learned it but i want you to start now alternating starting on this note the note g now with the second finger on the second string Now, it's very likely this is going to feel pretty awkward when you start, and that's okay. It's new. Things that are new are always going to feel a little bit unfamiliar, less familiar. That's the idea of them being new. It won't take too long for you to really develop a much more solid relationship with your scales if you start alternating the root note that you start on. Now, it gets even better because I don't want you to just play the scales up and down, but I also want you to do the scales in thirds starting on the thinner string every alternate day. Okay, so one day practice as normal, the alternating day, pattern one. Then pattern two. Another really super powerful tool you can use for developing your framework is single string solos, either with one finger or with multiple fingers, doesn't really matter, but making sure that you connect up all of the patterns that you've done so far. Depending on how much you're digging it, you could spend a whole five minute session just on one string, or you could play on one string until you start to feel a bit bored and then move on to a second string and then muck around on that one until you get bored again and move on to the next one. I would recommend within this still always allowing your musical imagination to win. If you hear an idea in your musical imagination that involves moving on to the next string, just do it. Just go with the musical imagination. 
I don't think it's a good idea to really block a musical idea from coming out of the instrument because you really want to cultivate that. You want it's the the coolest thing when you you start to hear an idea in your musical imagination that can come out. So if you find yourself playing something, improvising, making something up, and you get an idea and you feel like you can follow it, then just follow it. And if it goes wrong, it doesn't matter. Go back to doing the single string thing. But yeah, really try and cultivate that idea of, of hearing a musical idea and then letting it come out. Never, if, if you've got one, try and chase it. Try and figure out how, you know, how, to, how to make the sound that you hear in your imagination come out of your hands. It's a, a really valuable thing. But single string solos, really, really good. Uh, I've, I've just made a little backing track there. get the idea so that's a really really lovely practice session where you explore each string one at a time you really have to start seeing where those root notes are you have to see where the patterns are otherwise you're going to be making loads of mistakes and mistakes are the enemy here you really really want to be trying to get the notes right all the time you really don't want to make mistakes the more mistakes you make the more you fall out of the pattern the less that you're training up the right shapes and I know this, this is where it starts to get a little bit hard to explain the outcome. But what happens is you start to hear what the shapes sound like. So when I'm playing, I can, I don't even really even have to think about the shapes anymore. I hear the sound and my fingers are so used to playing those shapes, the scale patterns that they naturally go that way and can find the right sound. And then it only gets a bit awkward if you're playing completely out of the box or like free form atonal stuff where the sounds are maybe very angular or very dissonant. But you definitely want to learn how to play inside in a framework before you start trying to break out of the framework, I would recommend. There are lots of places where this can go. We can start looking at different intervallic things, string skipping. There's all sorts of different melodic ideas to explore, but I really feel like this developing the connection between those patterns and really making it musical, trying to build this relationship up between the patterns and the sounds and connecting with your musical imagination really is the, the foundation, the most important part of this whole idea of learning to improvise, particularly improvising within the major scale. Now it's time to get into your practice schedule for Unit 5. So we're going to have two five-minute slots again. The first one is going to start off as being just practice on pattern 3. So learning the scale, playing it up and down, memorizing it, working on it on playing it in thirds. Only when you feel super hip with pattern 3, I'd like you to move into the idea of practicing all of the major scale patterns that you've learned so far within the five-minute slot. So you're probably going to play pattern one up and down twice, then in thirds twice, then pattern two up and down twice, then in thirds twice, pattern three up and down twice, thirds twice. As you get faster, you're probably going to get more repetitions in. So you might end up being able to do each one of those things four times. Do remember that I want you from now on to alternate 
the starting note from the lowest root note to the highest root note really is a big deal really makes a big difference you most likely going to find that very difficult when you first start but that's okay it'll get easy fairly soon so don't worry about it too much if you find yourself with any excess time at the end of that practice slot, go back and work on whatever it was that you found the hardest. Maybe it be pattern three and thirds. If that's the newest thing, that might not feel as comfortable under the fingers. But if you're still struggling with the fingering on the thicker strings of pattern two, which is that little bit awkward, maybe you go back and work on that. Don't waste your time. Use it all up. But after you've done your set practice, work on the things that you're struggling with the most. The second five minute practice slot for this unit is going to be broken up into three different things which I'd like you to move between. The first one is single string solos, what we we're just talking about there. Really, really super powerful exercise. You can either spend your five minutes just working on one string, moving on to the next string, moving on to the next one within the five minutes, or you could spend the whole five minutes on one individual string, really trying to squeeze as much juice out of it as you can. The longer you stay on one string to practice for, the more things you'll discover about it. So don't always be in a hurry to move through all of the different strings because you might want to do that at the beginning. But the more you, yeah, really focusing in on one string and figuring out where the notes work and where the skips work, playing in thirds on one string is a really nice idea. This, you know, we've talked about it before, but play a note, miss a note, go back to the one you missed, miss a note, go back to the one you missed. This idea of playing thirds on one string is really, really nice, especially sliding up and then dropping back uh, to the note that you missed. It's definitely uh, worth a check out. I also, though, want you to spend five minutes. So this is the, the next section now that you would alternate. One day single string solos. The second day will be motive development. This is such a powerful idea. I don't want you to just drop it straight away. We looked at it last in the last unit, but... Yeah, don't don't let that ball drop. You want to keep on working on motive development. You can incorporate it into your single string stuff. I think that's a really good idea. But it's also worth having practice sessions where you just really focus on that. And I don't care what pattern you're in. You can play pattern one, two, or three. You can use single string stuff, do whatever you like. But the, the focus, the, the thing that you really want to be paying attention to is the idea of developing a motive. Playing a little idea, seeing if you can develop it. Well, how much mileage can you get out of one little idea? Okay, very, very powerful tool. And the third thing, okay, part C of this practice routine would be free improvising, just doing whatever you want. I would recommend that you try and focus on this connection between your musical imagination and your hand, trying to express an idea that you hear in your musical mind. That might not be there yet. For some people, it, it, and actually for some people, for me, it took... 15 years before I really started to hear a thing in my musical imagination and, and I was actually felt like I was playing an idea that I had. Before that, I, was, I felt like I was into it and I was you know, giving it everything I could, but I don't think I really was hearing an idea and, and, there, and, and trying to make it come out. And I think that's because I wasn't looking for it. I didn't realize people talked about playing by ear and they talked about like playing what you feel and all of these. There's all of these funny descriptions for it, but... When you really do hear something in your musical imagination and express it out the instrument, it's such an incredible feeling. And I think that you want to have a part of your practice routine where you're open for that to happen. And that's what I'd like you to have here. So free improvisation within the three patterns still, if you can. If you're free improvising and you go for a wander outside of that, it's perfectly okay. No one's going to get hurt. Don't worry about it. But probably sticking within the realms of the things that we've chatted about thus far. And if you can alternate between those three things, I think that's a really, really well-rounded routine and will prepare you fantastically for grade five. Now, grade five, we're going to finish off the other two patterns. We've got a whole bunch of other ideas that we're going to check out where we explore melodic sequences. So like we've got with thirds, we can also do fourths, fifths, sixths, and sevenths. Uh, we're going to look at playing dyads, playing two notes at the same time. There's so much amazing, fun things coming up. But the more time you spend on this initial framework, really solidifying and memorizing those first three patterns and playing in thirds and improvising with them and joining it up, you'll find the, the, the last two patterns relatively easy to join on, I hope. So look, I'm really hoping you're enjoying this. As usual, I'd love to see videos of you guys putting this stuff into practice. If you do make a video of yourself, stick it up on YouTube, leave me a link on the website for the related lesson that'd be really cool if you're over on youtube let me know how you're getting on in the comments always appreciate you slapping that subscribe button here you're supposed to slap likes you can slap the subscribe button and slap the like this week a special event one time only <laughs> okay i really hope you're enjoying this series uh remember there's loads of additional notes to help you out over on the website as well scale diagrams all that sort of stuff that you might need i'll see you for plenty more very soon you'll take care of yourselves bye-bye